I'm sure we'd all like to welcome Nick tonight to give us a, <laughs> giving us this talk. He's actually spoken to us three times before, on, and he's taken us around the world from India and Namibia and to the charity fields in Desford. So uh, tonight we're going over to Yellowstone and Grand Teton and um, visiting that area in the fall, if I'm correct. So, so Nick, thank you very much um, for offering to talk to us tonight, and um, we'll we'll set the talk going now. Right. <clears throat> I hope you can all hear me nice and clearly and um, off we go. As uh, has been said, um, this features Yellowstone, but it starts in um, another very, very beautiful national park that is just to the south of Yellowstone called Grand Teton. And two years ago, Prue and I were lucky to go on a nature trip uh, tour to the two beautiful national parks. Um, so it was um, in se late September and just into October is the month of um, this visit. We um, traveled from um, Heathrow to Denver in Colorado. Um, <clears throat> it's a long flight, but um, one of the joys of this flight was out of Prue's window, we were able to look down on um, Greenland. This is a, a view out of Prue's window mm -hmm. and under the wing, you've got um, at least three glaciers in view and all the uh, icebergs are carving and they're the white floating material. Um, beautiful view for us as we uh, spent a long, journey on the way to Denver, Colorado. <clears throat> uh, when you land in Denver, you have to wait a while, but um, you, you then take a one hour flight from Denver to Jackson Hole, which is in Wyoming. Wyoming's the um, cowboy county. The, the, all the, um, the states have got um, a number of very distinctive number plates. And this is one of the most distinctive of all, the, uh, the one for Wyoming. Now, if, if you look at the map, Yellowstone dominates it, but you can see in the south, and I've got a pointer that I'm hoping you can see, we land in Jackson Hole, just um, south of the Grand Teton National Park. Um, it's much smaller in size than Yellowstone. And I'll give you the, dime, the sizes in a minute, but you stay outside the park in each case. When we went to Yellowstone, we stay outside the park, just to the west in West Yellowstone here. And then in the Northeast, we go to Cook City finally, and we're staying just outside the National Park. Um, Yellowstone is the original National Park, 1872. And basically, unlike our National Parks, the, there's nobody living within this National Park. But um, Grand Teton is created as a National Park considerably later in 1929. And, um, there is a certain amount of development and farming within this national park because it's created so much later. <clears throat> and the two national parks are linked by um, the six, eight mile north south um, area called <clears throat> the John D. Rockefeller Memorial Parkway. So, um, all three areas link up to create, um, along with the surrounding areas, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, Yellowstone is <clears throat> 9,000 square kilometers. And as I said, the Teton is much smaller. It's 1,300 square kilometers. And the, the linking parkway is very small. Uh, we had two guides. They were both excellent. Uh, Adam is uh, from Idaho, the neighboring state, and he 
rejoiced in telling us uh, his main joke, which was, um, why is it so windy where I come from in Idaho? And then he had to tell us that because Wyoming sucks. Um, and he told us a number of times. Um, we, we became aware that uh, Adam, uh, with lots of brothers and a big family, not drinking tea, coffee, alcohol. Um, he was obviously Mormon. And uh, towards the end, we talked to him a bit about that. And although Alex, who's a sort of liberal guy from the East Coast of United States, would have very different, different views on many things, um, the two of them got on very well together. They um, were both excellent guides and they worked very well together. Um, Alex is particularly good on birds, um, but um, Adam is the, the guy who lives nearest to Yellowstone and he's been coming there since he was a child. Um, as said, we stayed in Jackson Hole and it's um, an upmarket cowboy town really mm -hmm. with um, lots of uh, restaurants, museums, souvenirs, um, up the road, there'd be ranches where Harrison Ford would live. Uh, you can see that um, they've they've maintained it as a, it's laid out on a grid. The buildings are all wooden, and you've got the sort of uh, balconies and the undercover walkways, and you expect to see John Wayne striding down one of these. Um, and um, as I said, it's full of uh, museums and interesting things to look at and visit. And we were there for three nights. Um, this is a small park in Jackson Hole. Um, underneath the arch are the, the antlers of a moose. And um, we would call it an elk in Europe. And to confuse things further, all the um, other antlers that make up the arch um, look very like red deer to us, but they call them elk. Their red deer or elk is a slightly larger version of our red deer. Um, it is cowboy country. Um, it's uh, the land of many famous uh, tribes of Native American Indians and um, we're on the edge of mountains which are the Tetons but we're also on the edge of the plains and most of Wyoming is actually plains rather than the Rockies but we're right on the edge and uh, the Tetons would be included in the Rockies. They're not all cowboys, as you can see here. The young lady is uh, leading leading the group. If you look into the, the background, um, the scrub vegetation is the sage bush, and um, there's uh, a mixture of deciduous, and then as you go up the slope, it gives way to conifers. And um, we'll talk more about those in a minute. Um, in 1803, the French uh, sold a huge land, uh, area of land between uh, the Rockies and um, the Mississippi Missouri rivers. Um, this was the Louisiana Purchase. And um, in order to encourage people to go and settle this area, um, settlers were given 160 acres of land and um, some of the settlers uh, were Mormons. Um, these buildings on Mormon Row are now just um, historic buildings, museums. Um, all, all the uh, buildings are now um, bought out from the inhabitants uh, and many of the Mormons have moved on perhaps to places like Idaho. Um, you've got the Tetons in the background that rise to 13,000 feet. Um, we're, we're in Yellow, when we're in Yellowstone, which is a little bit overall higher than this, we're, we're about 7,000 feet. 
and that would account for why by September you're getting some very cold nights and mornings. Um, the trees to the right of the building are the, the Fremont cottonwoods. Um, the tetons are particularly beautiful as I will show you shortly. Um, we said this is the fall, unlike the east coast where you're gonna have um, a lot of red of maples, the, the dominant colors are more yellows and oranges. Um, they're not quite as flame-like as, as the east coast fall. Um, the river in the background or the middle distance is the river Snake. And we're looking at um, scrub and low trees on a tributary of, of the famous river Snake. And then the land begins to rise up into the tetons in the background. Um, you've got, again, got the river Snake here, and this is the river that um, uh, Lewis and Clark used in order to find the route to the Pacific coast. Um, I'm not sure which is Lewis and which is Clark, but they're quite dependent on uh, good relations with native people who told them, if you follow this river, you will eventually get to the, the Columbia and then if you follow the Columbia, you will eventually get to the Pacific coast. Um, they, they found this route in, um, let me see, uh, 1805. So shortly after the Louisiana purchase. Um, this map shows you some of the, the routes that they used. Um, they've, they've done more than one expedition, but uh, the river Snake, does meet the Columbia and from there you can follow it through to the Pacific Ocean and you can see there they're, they're going up the Missouri and you can see the Mississippi in the background and you've got the 1803 Louisiana Purchase shown there and at that time a lot of the land that is now California and down to Mexico is Spanish territory. This is very typical of uh, the fall in the Tetons. Um, you've got uh, the, the Fremont cottonwoods and then it gives way to the, um, the slopes which are conifers. Uh, it isn't just the trees that give this uh, fantastic show of colour in the autumn. Uh, a lot of the um, beauty of this picture is in the, in the shades of yellows, oranges, of the um, of the grasses as much as the the color of the trees. Near Jackson Hole there are huge reed beds um, and although this will shortly become frozen um, this is a, a reserve a huge area that the elk come to in um, in the winter and they're safe here. They come down from the mountains and at the time we were there um, they hadn't yet arrived, but um, the water is not frozen and um, you've got uh, interesting bird life. We were looking at um, North American um, marsh harriers and things like that, but um, the swans are, are the trumpeter swans, which became very rare, but are now recovering. Um, another body of water here, and um, this is produced by, by beavers creating dams and then ponds. Uh, and this is an old beaver pond. Um, if you look in the middle distance, you can see something that looks very horse-like and you're probably saying, oh, I know what that is. And um, you'd be right. It's the moose or what we refer to as the elk in Europe. <clears throat> we didn't see any elk in the Teton but they came later. The Teton is the area to make sure you do see moose because um, although there's only 350 uh, moose in the Teton, they, there's only a hundred in Yellowstone. So this is the place to make sure that you, uh, you see the elk. Um, they enjoy this uh, aquatic, pond-like environment where they're going to feed partly on submerged vegetation. 
this is a huge bull oak um, um, mule, <clears throat> uh, moose, sorry. And um, you can hear them coming because they bugle. Uh, they don't roar like deer, but they, they, they give a bugle-like sound. And here it is uh, traveling quite quickly um, across the sagebush. Um, other signs of interesting wildlife on, on tree, a tree here, you've got the scratch marks uh, etched out by resin. Uh, and the, these are indicators of bears. And um, there are lots of black bears that are quite easy to see. Um, there are also grizzlies in this area, but um, much less common. And uh, these are young cubs that have been um, sent up the tree by their mother that's down the bottom um, for safety. Plenty of signs telling you what to do. It's big hiking country, but you people who are hiking uh, are not going alone. They're also got bells on the backs of their bags and um, they're making a noise as they go. Um, and the black, the black bears that we've seen are not going to be particularly dangerous, but the grizzly is. And um, this is a kind of hawthorn. It's called black hawthorn. And these berries are the sort of things that the, the bears are gorging on prior to the winter and their hibernation. The tourist industry makes um, use of the bear to advertise and to um, present to people a certain image of the animal. Um, and you've got to be careful. You're given signs and warnings, but with um, the, the bottom one, uh, the bison and the elk, um, you don't have to be as far away. Um, so 25 yards or to help you to coach buses. Um, but the, um, the wolf, and um, the grizzly, it's a much longer distance, at least a hundred yards, uh, in other words, the length of a, a soccer pitch. Another mountain range, a much smaller one it, on the edge of the, the Teton <clears throat> is um, the Gros uh, Ventre, uh, and it means in French, big belly. Now, if you take the nose of the sleeping Indian lying on his back, uh, I think that's his big belly under his nose. Um, I'll show you more pictures shortly of uh, the importance of this area. And this is where a lot of the famous uh, native Indian tribe names would be found. Um, there's two huge lakes in the, in the Teton. And um, these were points to which uh, the native Indians migrated in the summer to um, collect food and to basically enjoy the environment. Um, this shows you in a museum some of the, the products that you would get from the buffalo or you could make. You've got the bag on the right from the buffalo hide, the, um, the awls that would uh, act like needles and then the um, the bladder of um, a, a buffalo has been used to make that bag that has quills of porcupine. And uh, you're gonna do a lot of your sewing with the sinews from, from the animal. Um, one of the highlights of the Teton, and it's one of the highlights of the whole trip, and it would be why it is included as one of the major points along with Yellowstone is, um, the sunrise over the, the mountains. Um, we, we went there one morning early. Um, it's very cold and we're there for at least an hour and you're getting really chilled by the time you move on. But you watch the sun catch, catch the mountains and it's reflected in the water. As I said, they rise to over 13,000 feet. The river, which is a tributary of the snake, um, also played a, 
a big part in our enjoyment of that morning because um, the common raccoon was uh, ignoring us. It's turning over stones. It's looking for things that it can eat. Um, this is the only time we saw the raccoon. I think uh, they're more likely to be found and be a nuisance in suburban areas rather than um, in the natural setting. Um, I think the guides said they hadn't seen the raccoon on their previous trips or very infrequently. There, are, um, <clears throat> there were 50 million buffalo in North America. There's now about half a million, but the vast majority of them are uh, in commercial farms where they're being um, uh, producing meat. What, what one, our guide from Idaho calls beefalo. Um, basically, these are wild animals and they can go where they like. Um, and in the foreground, you've got the, the pronghorn antelope, which is the fastest um, antelope on the North American continent. It's slightly slower than a cheetah, but it's a very, very fast animal, very attractive one, but it can't jump. So um, it doesn't choose to jump, probably it just runs from its prey. Um, this is uh, reminiscent of all the Wild West films that you will have and I have seen. Big herds of grazing buffalo. The thistles in the foreground are an invasive species. It's a bit of a nuisance like our creeping thistle in, um, in Britain. And there's a couple of pictures now of the beautiful pronghorns. And finally, the tetons and in the foreground, the buffalo. Now we saw a lot of different uh, deer. Uh, look at the big ears on this one. Um, it's, it's a large deer and it's the mule deer. This is the male with its antlers. We didn't see many snakes. There are some poisonous snakes. Um, this is the Western garter snake, which um, people were very happy as guides to pick up, but um, I'm not very good with snakes, but uh, it was certainly very, very interesting. Not all the animals are enormous. Um, this is one of the smaller ones, but the delightful least chipmunk. The animals are preparing for winter and one of the strategies is obviously migration. So uh, widespread osprey um, is migrating southwards. Other birds like uh, Clark's nutcracker are collecting nuts and going to provision for the winter. The two names, Clark and Lewis, keep cropping up. Uh, they were the two people who found the route through to the Pacific. Um, Canada geese in their proper location in North America. And this is the Barrow's golden eye. Um, it's a bit like a wood pigeon would be, or a sparrow or a magpie. Uh, everywhere we went, and the guides refer to them as um, car park ravens. Uh, they're, they're basically um, looking for scraps that tourists drop and leave. Um, member of the thrush family, this is uh, occasionally comes to Britain, gets off course in migration time. Um, this is the American Robin. And uh, the two posts have got the mountain bluebirds on. A lot of uh, birds have already left and that would apply to the sack supper, sack sucker <laughs> that um, has made these holes in the, in the pine. Now, if you look carefully uh, in the middle, you've got a beautiful butterfly. You've got 
what we call the Camberwell beauty. Uh, they refer to it as um, the morning cloak, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Um, and uh, I think that it's reliably found at this site amongst the, the geysers and the hot springs. I don't know if the temperature has got something to do with it, but um, they said we'd probably see it here and we did. Uh, as I said, there are these, these big lakes on the edge of the Tetons. Uh, and this would be one of them. There's very few flowers left by the time we get there in late September, moving into October. Um, the harebell on the right and uh, attractive and unfamiliar plant to us was the Indian paintbrush on the left. As I say, there's very few plants at this time, but we did find a number of them. Uh, they weren't primarily interested as is often the case on these trips in the botany. Um, lupin leaves were evident everywhere, very, very widespread, and very few of them were still in flower, but we did find uh, that one. Now, one of the, we've moved into Yellowstone, and one of the um, major attractions of the trip is obviously to see the geysers in the area of Old Faithful. Um, but there are a lot more geysers than just that famous one. Um, more than half the geysers uh, are in Yellowstone. That's of the whole total in the world. This one erupts for a long period of time, several hours, called the castle. Um, we were lucky because it it doesn't erupt anything like as frequently as some of the other ones, but um, we, we, we went there twice uh, and we, in the two visits, we saw some of the main eruptions and geysers. Um, this is the castle again. They try and uh, give you an indication that uh, the less frequent uh, eruptions, when, uh, when you're likely to need to be there, and then you might be lucky sort of thing. Um, but uh, Old Faithful is the major attraction. Uh, and um, as you can see from the following photographs, the uh, eruption changes, obviously. Um, it's not gonna last more than about five minutes, uh, but you're going to see it a number of times if you're gonna be there, say, for a morning. Um, I. Um, recorded the first one at, uh, for us, uh, it's, uh, just after quarter past 10, the next one just after 10 to 12, and then I haven't got a picture of the next one, but it was in fact um, 20 past one. So it's, it's very regular, very, um, that's why it's called the Old Faithful. It, it is the major attraction, as you can see, a lot of people are making their way there. But there are a lot of people called, um, I've been calling them geezers, but of course they, they call them geyser gazers. Um, they take it very seriously. It's like um, a version of train spotting or bird watching. They're gonna be there with notes, um, notepads and iPads, um, waiting and recording various eruptions. They're gonna spend days doing this. Now, there's a huge variety of types of uh, eruptions and uh, hot springs and the like. You can see some of them are small and um, just boiling water. Others are clear and deep. And this one's bigger, but not enormous. Um, a lot of them are steamy. Some of them are quite, uh, dirty and um, this is one of the famous ones. It's a very large one called the Grand Prismatic Lake and also very beautiful. Uh, but you've got sort of smelly cave ones. You've got colorful deposits on rocks. You've got bubbling mud. The variety is very considerable. This one's bubbling away nicely. Um, 
it's been an area that um, has experienced volcanic and igneous activity for a long period of time. This uh, petrified tree is um, 50 million years old and it would have been buried and been excavated by nature and brought back to the surface. But on the right, you can see some of the evidence of possible tree rings that make it up. Um, this is like um, the sills and dikes and the flows that you get in Northern Ireland, the Giants Causeway. The, this would be the columnar jointing of, of dolerite. There's all sorts of interest for any geology, geological interest. Two um, creatures that I'm going to show you now that I don't think are quite as impressive as the ones we have in Britain. This is the American red squirrel, which isn't as red as ours. His ears are not as tufted. He's very sweet mm -hmm. and he definitely is behaving exactly as a squirrel should do here. That's the American red squirrel. The American Dipper lacks the white bib of our Dipper. It behaves in exactly the same way, but uh, again, I don't think um, they can quite match our Dipper. And they didn't call them goose sanders, but um, that's what they are. They're the same bird as we see. Um, we did a lot of um, work fairly early in the morning, trying to see wolves um, in parts of Yellowstone from um, the West Yellowstone location, which we were staying at. Um, and this was the first time that we came across the elk. Now there are a large number of elk in Yellowstone, but um, we hadn't seen them in the Grand Teton. And uh, you can see that it is essentially a large version of the red deer. You've got the, the stag guarding its females. Um, <clears throat> this is um, the main visitor center area of um, Yellowstone. And you've got um, hot springs that produce um, these deposits and the contrast of the, the elk is very marked. This is Mammoth Hot Springs. Um, again, the, these are all volcanic uh, igneous activity uh, rocks. Same again. Um, these are wild animals, but they were actually by the side of the road and we'd seen them on the cliffs, uh, but uh, at one time as we're actually coming towards the end of our trip, we were able to photograph them very close to the road. These are the bighorn sheep. That's a male, but not a particularly big one. And it'll probably get pushed out when it comes to the breeding season by a bigger one. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is the sort of animal that I'm talking about. This isn't our picture. This is taken from the internet, but uh, the bighorn sheep are very impressive animals. Um, we, we had lovely sunsets as well as sunrises. And um, we, we saw grizzly bears quite well. Um, the grizzly is, um, I always thought, well, it's called grizzly because it's bad tempered, but in fact, um, it's the, the coloring on its back as you'll see on them in a minute. Um, but having said that, it does have, um, its Latin name is Ursus Arctos Horribilis. So, um, you know, obviously some people, it has a reputation and uh, you have to be very careful with this animal. While we were in Yellowstone, we were told by the guides that they'd heard a guide had been killed by a grizzly in the Teton a day or two after we left. Um, there's only something like 700 um, grizzlies south of the Canadian border in Alaska, and they all occur in this sort of Yellowstone, Idaho, Montana part of America. 
Um, this one was known to them. They, they knew it immediately. It's um, the late Butte Sal, or nicknamed Raspberry. Um, this is a female, seven years old, and it's uh, busily feeding uh, and ignoring us. We're quite a few hundred meters away at a road, um, and uh, it's preparing for hibernation. But uh, you can see some of the sort of grizzled nature of the coloring across the shoulders of, of, the, of the bear. Um, we saw masses of bison and um, they're pretty slow moving. They, they like to sort of hang about on the pastures, on the river. And it's called a bison jam. When they want to cross the road, when they want to go up the road, you can be held up for quite a long time, half an hour waiting for them, because there'll be a large number of them possibly all just decided they'll walk up the road. Um, the, uh, one of the memories of Yellowstone is um, the sort of uh, igneous activity, the steam from the volcanic activity, and then, and then the, the large numbers, these herds of buffalo. Um, this is the coyote, which um, we saw very well at one point in Yellowstone. Um, it's smaller than the fox. If you look at its tail, it's um, perhaps, uh, sorry, it's smaller than the wolf. Um, uh, obviously it's bigger than the fox and you can see its bushy tail rather like a fox. <clears throat> it's going to, um, be, it can hunt animals bigger than a fox. Uh, it's blended into the autumn grassland here, but it's sort of stalking its prey rather like a fox would. Well, I said um, people don't live in the park. The, there's two big um, early 19, uh, 20th century hotels um, there. And uh, I think they're mainly um, places that you would eat uh, and get a drink, and use the facilities, but you get a flavor of the early tourist industry and the interest in the park from the vehicle. And, and I'll show you uh, another one of these um, inns or hotels. When you go in, you know, it's strange to us, but uh, it's quite a relief when you realize that people are, are not able to take their firearms in. Um, this, this is an interesting building. This is one of the, the other big hotels. <clears throat> it's uh, built in 1904. The architect is Robert Reamer and he's, he's using the lodgepole pines um, to, to build this place. And um, he's deliberately sort of making it asymmetrical. There's nothing symmetrical about the building he's sort of saying this reflects the chaos of nature. Um, and when you go inside, you really get, he's created the impression that you're in a forest. So most of these poles go up to 76 meters, which is the height of the typical lodgepole pine. And as you go up from one floor to another, you get these sort of branches off the lodgepole pine that have been created in order to give you the impression that you're in a forest. Now one of the major beautiful sites that we saw is the Yellowstone Gorge and River. Probably the Yellowstone is the only river in North America that is a natural river all the way down to where it joins uh, near the Missouri complex. Um, it's not dammed, there aren't lakes and reservoirs on it, and um, this is one of the beautiful sites that the early visitors and explorers came across along with the, all the geysers. There are two big waterfalls in this gorge. When the um, early travellers went back east and reported what they found in this area they'd been exploring, 
they weren't believed about the geezers and about this sort of beautiful scenery. Um, but um, Thomas Moran, uh, this is a famous uh, painting that would be in many, uh, many prints made of it. And it would be one of, one of the most famous North American paintings. This is 1872. So at the time of the creation of the park um, and it's not quite like that, but it's very nearly as beautiful as this picture. As I said, um, Lewis and Clark keep cropping up. There's a Lewis River, there are Lewis Falls, a Lewis Lake. Um, this, is, this river would be in this area, one where you could still find the, the cutthroat trout. This is the undergrowth that goes with the vegetation in the conifer forests. Um, two of the most uh, important <clears throat> and well-known trees are the um, lodgepole pine. And you can see how this gets its name. This is what you want if you're going to build a log cabin. It's uh, straight and unbranched. Uh, and the Douglas fir is well known. Now, to grow naturally, it appears that the Douglas fir needs to, and it always seemed to be growing in the shelter of a rock or a nursery rock. And it, it wasn't just this case, it's very, very much the case that nearly all of them that we saw had the, had the rock nearby. <clears throat> a feature of these forests and 80% uh, of Yellowstone is forest, is um, the fires that occur naturally or some of them are obviously uh, accidents or deliberate but um, nearly all of them are natural fires um, and when Pete and Jan went there shortly after 1988 they could see a lot of this um, but um, 1988 there was a huge fire that destroyed 36 percent of the lodgepole pine forests in Yellowstone um, if you look, um, although it's a scene of destruction, you can also see that there's regrowth and this would be a very good example. It's like the same undergrowth as I was showing you a minute ago. The, the trees do recover and they are regrowing after a severe fire. But this is a common scene in Yellowstone. Um, we went to our final stopping place, again, just outside the park. We're now in Montana, uh, and this is Cook City, which regards itself as a very cool place. There's um, only 76 permanent residents and um, very few tourists at that time, uh, because it's already beginning to snow, although it's just at the beginning of October. But one of the reasons that this is an interesting and rather cool place, you've got um, the Cook City store, which is a historic uh, landmark, as you see, a national historic landmark. Now, when you go in, it's really not changed since um, something like 1877 when it was built. Um, these are the typical counters. They're selling a lot of uh, things for fly fishermen, but uh, the whole place is also like a museum. Uh, this is a sort of safe they don't use anymore that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid would blow. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting place, but you could buy, like many village shops, they've got everything in there somewhere that you could want. Um, as I said, we've moved to Montana um, another one of these uh, number of plates that sort of sum up the, the, the wildlife of the area. Um, you can see that by the time we arrive, it's already snowed. Um, not a big covering, but uh, all the passes are not going to be open for more than a few weeks. Um, there aren't going to be a lot of trips that can go and are going to go over the passes anymore. Um, but Miner's Saloon, a casino, that in the right is the uh, 
Cook City store. store. Um, it's quite difficult to find places to eat. Many of them are closed now, but this would be one of the diners that we would have uh, had an evening or a meal or a breakfast at. And as I said, this is an area that's very famous for a lot of the names of tribes, the, the Blackfoot, the Crow, um, and a name that I didn't know, but my brother did. Uh, he, he wasn't surprised when I told him about this story. The French, Nez Pierce, Pierce, Pierce Nose, um, and Chief Joseph is particularly famous. This handsome man, he led his people. If you look at the map, they lived in Oregon, and at the time of the gold rush, um, they had to leave. They had driven out, and you follow the red line, and it goes through Idaho. It goes along the border of Montana. It just goes into um, Yellowstone um, and uh, Wyoming, and then it make, makes its way up towards the Canadian border. And uh, they were being chased by <clears throat> the, the army and they kept um, avoiding them and eluding them. And they were escaping towards Canada. And if they could get there, then they could settle and there would be no problem. They mistakenly settled 30 miles south of the Canadian border and the American army caught up with them and they were forced to surrender and then had to enter reservations. Um, Chief Joseph actually lived until uh, 1912. He has a long life uh, and uh, this, this trek uh, is in uh, the, the age of the gold rush, uh, 1870s. Now, <clears throat> um, Wolves are on the left and on the right, you've got a different scale. So you don't want to get confused. And along the bottom, you've got three of the prominent species. But uh, in uh, 1995, controversially, but successfully, the wolf was reintroduced. And if you look, uh, we've got small wolf numbers, the red line at the start of the graph, and um, you have to read off the elk numbers from the right, but the numbers are very high, sort of 13, 14,000. And the reason that the wolves were reintroduced is that the elk were basically eating out a lot of the vegetation, particularly along the rivers. But once the number of elk declines, as they're predated by the wolves, uh, you can see the wolves increasing and the elk declining, the vegetation began to regrow. So beavers came back and gradually um, some moose have come back. Uh, and you can see then the wolves decline as the amount of prey declines. And the two are roughly in balance by the time you come to the uh, graph, which is uh, 2017, the latest date there. And the number of buffalo are increasing as the amount of uh, grazing increases. The elk uh, are predated by the wolves, but um, they also um, have to be on the move. They're trying to avoid the wolves so they don't spend all their time eating out the vegetation and the vegetation begins to come back. Um, the wolves chased out the coyote in Yellowstone or certainly controlled them. And uh, then the pronghorn begins to come back, which was hunted by the coyote. So um, if a wolf goes outside the park, say where we are at Cook City, um, it's in danger of being shot, but inside the park, they're safe. Um, the geyser gazers are replaced by the wolf watchers. Um, these wolf watchers, um, seemed to us to be as interested in the bear, in the bears. They said, oh, wolves are easy to see. We're not interested. Um, we want to see the grizzlies. But they were looking at the occasional grizzly bear 
up on the slopes up on the horizon and you you could hardly make them out but there were some up there um, we were in cook city for about four or five nights and um, we spent a lot of time looking for wolves uh, there's a lot of uh, packs of wolves uh, as you can see from the map um, the the ones nearest to cook city you've got um, the lamar and uh, that area we um we've got a lot of evidence of wolf droppings but we took a long time to see wolves this is the lamar valley with the sagebush and the river would be in the middle distance uh, and this is the area that we were constantly watching but the wolves had taken off somewhere i think it's 11 in this pack and they disappeared for a few days but um, on almost the final day, we, uh, we did see the pack and uh, they're about half a mile away. The, the photographs are not great, but um, we, we saw, first of all, this black wolf come in. And then you can see in the, just above the sagebush in the middle distance, there's um, a, at least two wolves there. And then gradually we, we saw all 11. That's taken on the left from inside um, the window of a vehicle. But uh, the, the next pictures of the wolves are all taken from the internet. They're not our pictures. And this is uh, in, a, in a museum. <clears throat> So we, we did see the elk, the moose, the coyote, the wolf, the bison. We didn't, uh, we didn't see any um, beavers. We didn't see any otters, which would sometimes be seen. This grainy picture is um, one of the two eagles that we saw. The other eagle we saw frequently was the bald eagle. And uh, the area that surrounds um, Yellowstone has got fantastic mountains, although they're outside the, the park. Um, we went on a, fa a fabulous drive, which is regarded as one of the most attractive in um, North America, up to the summit of the Beartooth Pass. We're at uh, nearly 11,000 feet. The arrow is pointing at the bear's tooth. This is snow from the previous winter and we're about to get uh, the pass closed within a, probably a week or two of us having been up there. There's the bear's tooth again in the middle of the picture. In the foreground, you've got an idea of um, the amount of snow that's still there from the previous winter. And this is tundra vegetation, very low to the ground, very sparse. And as I said, it's a really attractive route that people drive. And this is some of the scenery that we were traveling through. And then finally, <clears throat> we leave um, to come home and we leave by the, the Northern Gate. Uh, this is the Ru Roosevelt Arch and we're in the park and then we're going to go out through it. Yellowstone's created, as it says, for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. It's the first national park. March the 1st, Act of Congress, 1872. This is the first national park in the world. And <clears throat> This is the River Yellowstone, but outside the park now. And um, it's like the Lamar Valley physically, but the Lamar Valley is not grazed by animals. It's not farmed. It's not got settlement. It's not got irrigation. And this is one of the booms of the irrigation systems. Um, it's attractive country, but it's, um, been uh, colonized, unlike Yellowstone, which is all still 
pretty natural, especially now the wolves are back. And we had a fabulous time and we're back here with the background of the, the Tetons and um, this is the end of our tour and we hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for a lovely talk, Nick. And if you'd like to um, stop sharing your screen, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? If you do, just unmute yourself and, and, um, and ask. And don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Karen looks very embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nick, just to just to start off, uh, what's your highlight from the trip? What 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 was the, the thing that you remember uh, as the particular star of the, of the holiday? <clears throat> I think um herd, herds of, of buffalo probably, but you can't um, you can't take away the beauty of the the Teton mountains at the beginning, uh, reflected in the the river. Um, I I like the whole idea of being able to appreciate the the role of the wolves. We didn't see wolves very close, but I think if you went in the winter you would stand a good chance, but it, it would be very, very cold. People do run trips there. But I think, um, <clears throat> I don't know what Prue would say, but I think, you know, just the the romance of the herds of, of buffalo on on the plains was wonderful. Yeah, it's just, just like you've seen on the telly <laughs> sort of thing. But I mean, it is, it's just, just, uh, just these fantastic vistas and these animals and, um, and all the colours and everything. Yes, it was very, very, very special. Very special. And I like the bears up the tree, the baby bears, the bear cubs <laughs> up the trees as well, because they're just right next door to the road. They could have jumped on the car's roof, but they didn't, because they've been good little bears staying where their mum had told them to stay. But um, that was very I think I think Roy might have a question. He's waving yeah. his hand. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, we, we've done a similar trip. But we were in a, a tour bus. Mm. Were you in a, a sort of smaller vehicle? And were you able to walk and hike? Yeah, we're in two smaller vehicles. Each um, each of the uh, the guides, the American guides, were drivers. Um, we were able to walk a bit, but uh, it was more. <clears throat> sort of stand and look. Uh, there were there were places, yeah, in the Teton where where we were out walking and looking at the flowers. We walked near a, a lake uh, that's on the watershed between the Pacific and the Atlantic. Um, but um, yeah, it's not a. It wasn't. It was uh, very far from going rambling. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you a question, Nick? Um, the effect that the um, wolves have had on the area is very obviously the right thing to do, and it's worked brilliantly. But did you feel that the locals um, were as appreciative as we might be? Yeah, I mean, all the people in the park, um, and uh, I think if you're um, a landowner, I mean, people like hunting uh, and they like to shoot things and have a trophy. So um, outside the park, uh, wolves are very much at risk. Um, but, but the people in the park that we met, I mean, like we saw a couple of shots of people standing along the road looking for wolves and bears. They were a bit like the, the geyser watchers. They were wolf watchers, sort of. Um, so there were a lot of people genuinely interested and, and wanting to keep seeing them and count them and, and, um, and monitor them. And they're local. Mm. Yeah. They're local people. Mm. But then there aren't people actually living in the park. So, you know, the wolves have got a sort of free, free area, really. No, no. 
Thank you. Okay. Anybody else got a question? Yes. Well, yeah. Um, which the, the grizzly bear or the one up the tree? Yeah. Mm. Well, um, they're not as dangerous as the grizzlies, but um, we got out of the vehicle and we were quite close, I would say. Mm. But there are a lot of um, volunteer <clears throat> people who control um the visitors so we were told you can't go here you can't go any closer right it's time for you to move back into your vehicles now because the mother's coming back down the slope and that kind of thing yeah so it's a combination of them being fairly high up in a tree and being able to zoom zoom the camera up to it sort of thing Yes, yeah. yes. We, 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 couldn't, we couldn't see the mother. She was no. somewhere bashing around in the bushes. Mm. But um, yeah, we, we're probably a good 50 meters away, yeah. but I would say we were closer than the, the, the notices later indicated, mm. but there are people supervising us. Mm. They're not the guides, they're, they're people saying, you know, yeah, they're pretty obviously. strict. You can't do this, right? You must move back. There's yeah. too many of you here, it, it that was, kind of thing. Yeah, it was right beside the road. It just happened <clears> to be right beside the road. Uh, and the road is kind of a fairly um, well-used tourist road for people coming into the park. And so these sort of volunteers were there to sort of, a bit like traffic wardens, really. I mean, they didn't let people stop their cars there. They had to move on. And um, they sort of, you know, just regulated things so that the, no one got too close or the bears didn't get stressed and that kind of thing. Okay. Well, yes, Roy. Yeah, we had a very similar experience in our coach. Mm. Driving along and the coach driver said, hey, up, there's a bird jam. And literally, the traffic was at the side of the road and the, the bears were probably about 20 yards from the road mm. and people were getting out and there were people there saying, don't go off the road and if they come towards you, get back in your car. So, so yeah, there's a lot of um, supervision in the park. Mm. Um, uh, but it's done very discreetly. We never, we never felt we were being hounded. Mm. <laughs> it's a cat. It's a <laughs> Nick, how many uh, how many miles did you do? Did you get a record of how far you had to travel and how many nights you were in the vicinity? Yeah, <clears throat> um, we we were basically there for about two weeks. Um, we we didn't. The travelling was not not oppressive really at all. Um, in the Grand Teton, we, we'd travel 10 miles a day sometimes, not much further. Um, to get from the Teton to Yellowstone <clears throat> took um, two, two and a half hours. Um, when we were in Cook City, and uh, you get to the Lamar Valley very quickly. Um, the 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 travelling wasn't uh, something that we found difficult at all. It didn't uh, it didn't occupy large parts of the day. No, you tended to travel a little bit and then get out and look at something, or you go to the Lamar Valley and look for a bit, and then move on somewhere else for a little while, and then come back again to have another look, sort of thing. So you sort of it's quite a lot of getting in and out of the vehicle, but you're getting in and out of the vehicle to 
see something or stand and watch for something or, and that sort of thing. Yeah, um, we I think we were in um, Jackson, the first place for three nights, then <clears throat> West Yellowstone, probably for four or five and Cook City for five. Yeah, something like that. Thank you. Well, I think that's a good point for me to say thank you to Nick on behalf of all of us for a very interesting talk this evening. Um, it was quite a trip down memory lane for Peter and I, because as Pete men uh, Nick mentioned, Peter and I did visit Yellowstone just after the fire. It was probably a season or two after the fire in 1988, so it was an awful long time ago. But the change to the park is tremendous because we visited before the walls were reintroduced and also there was a lot of devastation and the regrowth was only just beginning to start. So it was really interesting to see how the park has developed in the time since then. And just want to thank Nick for a very interesting talk because it covered not just the, the scenery, that, which was fantastic. It also covered a, a lot of mammals that you were very lucky and they also threw in some botany and geology. So you touched all bases, Nick. So thank you very much for a very interesting talk. And um, I'm sure we would all like to clap our hands and say thank you very much, but it's going to be a bit strange over Zoom. But uh, <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Andy.